I'm William Fry with the Social Science Data Analysis Network at the University of Michigan. And we're very pleased to present the second of three sessions on using R and Python to analyze the American Community Survey data. Uh, as I say, this is the second of the three. The last one was last Wednesday, where we talked about working with the 2021 ACS with R. Uh, this week, we're going to be talking about mapping and spatial analysis with the ACS and R. And next Wednesday, uh, we'll be talking about working with geographic data and mapping and maps in, with Python. And the expert on all of these items is Professor Kyle Walker of Texas Christian University, who is well versed on being able to analyze census data, American community survey data, and all related topics with R, uh, with Python, and uh, with all kinds of subroutines and tricks that he knows about and he has developed himself. We're so pleased to have him with us. Uh, he is, as I said, associate professor at TCU. He's a director of the Center for Urban Studies. And he is clearly uh, the expert on how to analyze all of this stuff with R and with Python with specific focus on census products, which of course are very, very useful for all kinds of things. Uh, the Social Science Data Analysis Network, uh, which is hosting these is, as I said, located at the University of Michigan. Our job is to try to make census data and also other related data accessible to teachers so that they can use them in their classes, uh, not only in early classes, but more sophisticated classes. Uh, and to give them the latest techniques when possible. And that's where these, this three, three hour series fits in. Uh, as Kyle will probably tell you, you, you don't have had to listen to last week's session to get everything out of this session. They're all fairly self-contained, although we're eventually going to make videos of all of them available to everybody that wants them. Uh, I also wanna mention that Kyle has just come out with a new book the Analysis of U.S. Census Data, Methods, Maps, and Models in R, just out right now. And uh, he will tell you a little bit more about that as well. But without any further ado, uh, I'm very pleased to present Kyle Walker, who will be presenting today's webinar. Kyle. I will. Thank you so much, Bill, for the generous introduction. Uh, thanks again to the University of Michigan and to SSDAN for coordinating and hosting uh, this workshop series. And uh, thank you to all of you for uh, taking the time to, you know, spend an afternoon or, you know, whatever time of day it is, wherever you're joining from uh, with us to learn a little bit uh, about some of these tools that I think, as Bill mentioned, have pretty broad applicability. And so Basically, I'm going to be kind of going through these first few minutes, uh, you know, consolidating some of those introductions and talking about uh, the structure of today's workshop and what we're trying to accomplish and how to get up and running and how to follow along. So uh, there will be, if, for those of you who attended the previous workshop, and I imagine there is some overlap, there will be a little bit of review for you at the beginning. Um, for those of you who didn't attend last week's workshop, uh, don't worry about that at all, because we're going to get you up and running, no problem. So uh, let's go ahead and jump right into it. Uh, first things first, um, again, uh, a, li a little bit about me. Again, I'm an associate professor of geography at TCU. Um, I'm also a, a, you know, broadly practicing spatial data science consultant in, you know, a wide range of fields in which you know, I'm mostly brought on to help with this type of work, working with demographic data more efficiently. And I'm excited to share some of those insights with you. So I've developed a number of R packages, some of which you'll be learning about today. Um, perhaps most prominently, the Tidy Census package for working with U.S. Census Bureau data. And as Bill mentioned, uh, my book, Analyzing U.S. Census Data, Methods, Maps, and Models in R, just came out. So um, the official release day is tomorrow. I have copies. I am thrilled with how it turned out. And uh, this is chock full of knowledge that I would um, 
if you're interested or if you find this stuff helpful today, you can expand upon this in the book. A great way to support these free workshops, uh, if you're so inclined, is to go pick up a copy of the book. Again, official release date is tomorrow. Uh, you can buy from Amazon. You can buy from, direct from the publisher, CRC Press. Uh, but you know, if the price is a little bit too steep, the book is freely available online and will remain freely available online. You can go read it. You can copy paste the code. You know that that was something that was important for me to do, and CRC Press has been very supportive of that. But you know, again, um, if you're looking for ways to support this free content, going and picking up a book uh, would be fantastic and much appreciated. So, what are we doing in this workshop series? So last week. Uh, we introduced the workshop series with a general introduction to the 2021 American Community Survey and how to work with that data in R and Tidy Census. If you missed that workshop, uh, I'm going to show you how to access all of the materials from last week's workshop. And we are working on posting the video from last week as well, so you won't miss out. Uh, additionally, if you didn't attend last week's workshop, there isn't any prior knowledge from last week. I mean, all extra knowledge is helpful, but there's nothing that was covered there that is required for participating today. Today, we're focusing on mapping and spatial analysis uh, with ACS data in R. Excited about that. And next week, we're going to branch out a little bit and look at a brand new Python package I've released called Pygris that brings some of these tools over to Python. So if you're interested in learning a little bit about Python, there'll be no expectation of prior Python knowledge coming in. This will be a great opportunity to get your feet wet and learn what I think are some pretty useful tools for working with spatial data on the Python side. In terms of today's agenda, so the way that we organize this workshop series is into three hourly chunks. Uh, the first hour will be devoted to uh, kind of getting everybody up and running and, ge you know, generating kind of a shared core vocabulary. So we'll be focusing on working with spatial ACS data. What is the ACS? What is spatial ACS data? How does it work? And what can we do with it? Uh, that'll go probably right to the top of the hour, at which time we'll take about a 10 minute break. And it, which is a great time then to ask questions. And I'll be keeping an eye on the Q&A as well. Um, in hour two, uh, we'll be focusing on making maps of ACS data in R. I'll be introducing a variety of sort of standard uh, cartographic methods and show you how to use the popular visualization package ggplot2 to make those maps. And hour three, we're gonna dip our toes into some more advanced methods. So if you're coming from the social sciences background, uh, we're going to look at how to analyze segregation and diversity and make maps. And uh, then we're going to spend some time as well on spatial analysis and location intelligence. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about that, how you identify hotspots uh, using spatial analysis tools and then introduce some brand new functionality. Even for those of you who are long-term tidy census users, uh, I've, got a, I've got a brand new uh, method in there that I think you'll find pretty interesting, and you're among the first to ever see it. So that's coming pretty soon. So what we're gonna I'm gonna cover is uh, the ACS in brief here, and then um, I want to share how to get up and running. And before jumping into all of this, so I do want to point you to some of the materials. Watch the chat right now. I'm sending out a message to the chat. You're going to see two links. One is a link to the workshop GitHub repository. And one is a link to the POSIT cloud environment that I have pre-configured to get set up with these resources. And so um, I envision kind of three potential groups of people that are attending these workshop series. You know, one group of people is you're very, very interested in what's going on here, want to learn some new methods. You've never used R before. You're not necessarily looking to get into it today, but you maybe want to see what's out there. And that's fantastic. Um, there will be a lot for you to learn from here. And then if you want to go back and try to learn some of this stuff down the road, there will be resources available for you to do that. The second group uh, might be a group that is interested in dipping their toes into R 
and is you know maybe not quite ready to install R on their computers. They want it, but they want to try it out. You're going to want to click that pause it cloud link, and that pause it cloud link is going to take you to a pre-configured workspace for working with today's data sets, and it gives you all the code that you need as well. Advanced users want to go to the GitHub link. And um, we jump over here, I can show you what I'm talking about. This is the GitHub repository that you'll be taken to for the workshop series. Uh, if you've never used GitHub before and, and you don't want to go this route, I wouldn't worry too much about it. If you have, you can navigate through these folders, spatial data is today's workshop, and you'll find this R script called spatialdatacode.r. That's going to be all the code that you need for today's workshop. So if you want, you can copy paste all of this code into um, a, an R script editor inside of our studio. If you're a more advanced user, you've been working with this before. If you're a very advanced user and you're comfortable with Git and you have cloned the repository to your computer, you'll want to run the command git pull and pull down the new materials if you worked with it last week. Or if you're new, use this command to clone the repository to your computer and then make sure you have all the required packages installed. Again, if you're in the first two camps, you don't need to worry about that complexity. A great way to get up and running with today's workshop materials is to use this posit cloud link. And so if you click there, what that will do is it'll take you to Posit Cloud, which is a cloud-based environment for data science that's provided by Posit, which is the rebranded name of our studio. And our studio is now a product that Posit maintains, and that is the software that we're going to be using today to do our work. So if you click that link in the chat, uh, you'll be you'll fire up or launch, so to speak, that environment. And so It'll look a little something like this. Um, I can go and, and open that up. You'll be asked to sign in with a Google account if you don't have one already. Um, you can also sign up with a GitHub account if you have that, and your project will be deployed. And so once the project will just take a few moments to deploy. And once it deploys, sure what you're going to what you're going to see is actually a pre-configured environment that has the code ready to go for you to do your work. What you'll likely want to do is click this save a permanent copy link to copy this workspace over to your account. Now, I'm, you may have some questions if you attended last week's workshop about, well, does my environment from last week sync up with the new updates? If you copied over last week's workshop into a separate workspace by saving that permanent copy, it doesn't sync up. You've created a new environment. But what you can do, so for example, I can click on my workspace, and this is for those of you who attended last week. You'll notice that you have this SSDAN Workshops 2023 project derived from my project. If you click this link for the project from which your workspace was derived, what that will actually do is redeploy the project from my workspace, and it will give you access to that pre-configured environment. So, you know, this is a great way. I see someone saying that they can't see the GitHub link. So some of you may have just joined. Let me go ahead and re repost in the chat. Just to want to make sure that everybody gets access to these materials. Um, so check, check the chat for those links. So what I'm going to do here is now I'm going to click save a permanent copy. Um, that's going to copy that over for me. I'm going to come back to this in just a moment and, uh, and, and we'll get moving with it. So let's jump in here to part one working with spatial American community survey data. And so for those of you who attended last week, uh, this will be a little bit of a review, but I want these workshops to be self-contained. And for those of you who are new today, thank you so much for coming out. Let me get a little bit of an introduction to the American Community Survey, which is 
the data resource from the United States Census Bureau that we're going to be learning about today. So the American Community Survey is an annual survey of about three and a half million or so U.S. households. So it covers maybe 10, 11 million Americans. And um, the American Community Survey is going to be your resource for finding data on detailed topics um, with respect to demographics, economics, and the labor market. So you're likely familiar with the decennial United States Census, which is uh, a complete count enumeration of the U.S. population, takes place every 10 years. The most recent one we did was in 2020, so we do it at the top of each decade. <coughs> The decennial census only gives us information about core demographic statistics, such as race, ethnicity, age, sex, and really that's about it. Um, maybe a couple of housing statistics as well. The ACS gives us all sorts of rich characteristics from income, education, language, housing characteristics, really a whole lot more. And there are two flavors, so to speak, of the ACS. They're available as one-year estimates, which are annual estimates that are rolled out every year that are available for geographies of population 65,000 and greater. Five-year estimates are a rolling average over a five-year period that gives us a bigger sample size because it is a survey that allows us to go all the way down to the census block group, which I'll show you in just a moment. When we're working with spatial ACS data, the five-year ACS estimates, generally speaking, are going to be more of interest because spatial analysis is often involving small area analysis. And you don't have any small areas that have populations of 65,000 and greater. And so we need the five-year ACS rather than the one-year ACS in many of our spatial analysis projects. An important thing to remember with the ACS, these are estimates characterized by a margin of error. So even when we talk about counts today, those counts are estimated counts. They are not true counts. Uh, they are estimates of what we think the count is subject to a margin of error, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a moment. So how do you get ACS data? There are a lot of different resources available to find ACS data. Uh, you'll have sources directly from the U.S. Census Bureau, data.census.gov. That's going to be your main data portal for finding downloadable extracts from the ACS. But one thing that's fantastic about data.census.gov, it's a user interface built on top of something called the Census Application Programming Interface, or API. And the API is an interface that allows developers to connect to these data resources and build applications on top of it. And so data.census.gov is one such application developed by the Census Bureau, but also third-party developers like myself can go in and build applications in their software of choice to try to streamline the process of working with Census Bureau data. It is a phenomenal resource that I personally um, am very, very grateful for. And so we're going to be accessing that ACS data through Tidy Census, which is an R package that uh, I've developed, I've been working on over the past five years to talk to some of the most popular APIs, the most popular data sets from the, uh, from the Census Bureau. And so um, the ACS is maybe going to be the number one data set that you use Tidy Census for. And what Tidy Census tries to do is streamline the process of working with um, American Community Survey and other census data resources. Typically, if you're trying to work with spatial ACS data, say in a traditional GIS environment, it can be kind of a cumbersome process where you have to pull down the data and then you have to get it in the right format and then find a shape file and then put that together. Tidy Census does that, all of that for you. It pulls down the data for you it shapes it in a format ready to go for analysis uh, with respect to the tidyverse, a popular analytic framework in R. It pre-joins census geometries. So you get your spatial ACS data automatically. I'll show you how to do that. And it gives you a lot of tools for working with, say, POMS data, 
and, uh, and streamlines the process of doing um, targeted requests as well. So um, R and R Studio R. If you haven't used it before, it's one of the most popular programming languages and software environments for data analysis. It really started out as a language for academic statistics, but it is basically anything that you can dream of. You can do it in R, or someone is thinking about that. Reproducible reporting, building websites, all the slides for today I, I built in R in R Studio. Uh, geographical analysis, demographic analysis, um, just uh, general data wrangling tasks, connecting the databases, I could go on. In my opinion, the premier way to work with R is through RStudio, which is an integrated development environment, or IDE, uh, for working with R developed by the company Posit. And the Posit cloud environment, which I'll jump back to right now, looks like this. And so what you'll see here is basically a kind of a number of different panes. Our studio is organized into panes. What we see here is an R console. You can think of that as an interactive command prompt where you can type in commands and get commands back like two plus two, that equals, that equals four, that sort of thing. Uh, but also you can write code in, say, a text file and send that code over to the console. And so I'm going to do a little bit of organization here with respect to how I like to organize my work. I'm going to click here, and I encourage you to do the same, on spatialdatacode.r. That's the R script that includes all of the code necessary for today's workshop you'll notice that the code jumps out at you here. And now it's, it's shown in a new pane for the script editor. I like having my R console over on the right-hand side. I like having my script editor and then my console side by side. So I'm going to click this little window icon here and choose the option console on right. You'll notice how my console moves to the right. You'll see two other panes. One is the environment pane. That's where we're going to be able to see all of the objects that we've created. I'll explain that more in just a moment. And then we'll see the files browser here. There's also a plots tab and a viewer tab for viewing of both static and interactive plots. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. To get started with Tidy Census, you don't have to do this if you have the POSIT Cloud environment installed. You may also have these packages installed already, but if you need to, go ahead and use the command install.packages to install these packages. So the core packages we're using are Tidy Census and Tidyverse today. That will be enough to run most of the examples in the workshop. Some more advanced examples are going to be um, using a variety of other add-on packages to the spatial ecosystem in R, uh, they can occasionally be a little bit more difficult to install or configure on your own computers. So I'm sort of leaving that as, as optional uh, to use. If you are using uh, the POSIT cloud environment, then everything has been pre-configured and tested for you. So we should be ready to go on that front. An optional thing that you probably should do but don't need to do for the purposes of today's workshop is to set a census API key. So as of tidy census, I believe version 1.3, um, the census API, tidy census can access the census API without an API key. You're then limited to 500 queries per day. So if you're looking, that'll be, we're not querying 500 um, over 500 times today. But if you are looking to kind of become a power user and really use this heavily in your work, you're going to want to get an API key. You can follow the link in the slides, and the slides are linked in the GitHub repository, um, by the way, if you like to have those up, and uh, pass it to a function in Tidy Census called Census API Key that will install and then it optionally stores the key for future usage. So it's good practice, not required for today if you're just getting started, but I would consider doing that moving forward. All right, let's dig in. Let's talk about spatial census data using Tidy Census. So a big 
motivation for me to write Tidy Census was frustration that I observed in teaching introductory GIS courses, Geographic Information Systems courses here at TCU. You know, I knew that working with demographic data it was an essential skill, having worked as a GIS analyst outside academia for a time uh, before coming to teach. And I would set up a lab assignment for students and the step-by-step -step process was in many cases laborious. The typical process generally involves, so you go and you need to, okay, you define your study area, you need to go and find shapefiles from the census website. Shapefiles, if you haven't worked with shapefiles before, they're very, very popular geographic data sets that in some cases are very strange, especially for students to understand, because they're a collection of files that are all required to get the data to work, but they all live in the same directory. You can't lose some one of the required ones, but it's even explaining that to students gets kind of tricky. So you have to find those shape files, and then you have to go and find your data, a CSV or Excel spreadsheet of data. You might clean it up in Microsoft Excel, prep it for joining or merging to your GIS. You load your data into your GIS of choice. You align key fields, and the key fields are not always aligned for the join. They might not be of the correct type. So you have to play around with that. And then finally, you can actually do your work. This is a process that is reasonably repetitive, but at the same time, it's required to kind of get your data up and running. One of the beautiful things about working with a programming language to do data science and data analysis is you can design workflows to automate the repetitive tasks like this and allow you to focus on the more interesting and creative tasks. And that was something that I really sought to accomplish with Tiny Census. I spent so much time on these repetitive tasks. I wanted to get to those creative tasks faster. And that's what Tidy Census tries to do. So in Get ACS, Get ACS is your portal to get ACS data in Tidy Census. There are two required arguments to get going. Um, one is geography and one is variables. So it tells you the level of aggregation at which you wanna get your data. And then one or more variables of data, the metrics, so to speak, that you wanna get from the ACS. I'll go into more depth on both of these pieces in a moment. Optionally, you can specify a state or a state and county combination, and you can specify a year. The default year is typically, um, I keep that up to date. It's the latest release of the five-year ACS. So once the new five-year ACS comes out, I make the new default year for Get ACS that year. So we default to the 2017 to 2021 five-year ACS. The argument geometry equals true. It's just a few characters. It's one line. This argument does everything on the previous slide for you in one line of code. Let me show you how this works. I'm going to jump back over to Posit Cloud, and I'm going to go ahead and start running some code. So how we run code in our studio, a couple different ways you can do it. I can highlight. So I double clicked here to highlight this line of code. You'll note that it turns blue. And then I can click this run button. Or if I prefer a keyboard shortcut, I can do control enter. And that will send the command to the console. So I just typed control enter. And that sends the command library tidy census, which loads tidy census into my R session and makes functions in tidy census available to me. It, it sends that command over. So here I'm requesting ACS data at the county level for this variable, which represents median household income. I'll explain to you how you figure that out in just a moment. For Texas, from the 2021 five-year ACS, it defaults to the five-year ACS. And geometry equals true tells tidy census Go head over to the census website, grab a shape file of counties for Texas, 
process the data, merge it to your demographic data, and give back a result. I grab the data, and that whole process that would take you hours, that would maybe take you, you know, if you're an advanced user, it's going to take you a little less time, but for my students, hours upon hours. just took us about a second. This is, I think, one of, this is sort of the magic sauce of tidy sentence, the secret sauce. Like in this particular case, we now have our spatial ACS data. We can plot this using base R plotting commands. I plot the estimate column. I'll show you the general structure of that, but here we have, functionally an income map of Texas. We have, we see here around the big cities, Houston, in particular suburban counties near San Antonio, Austin, Dallas, Fort Worth, and Houston tend to have the highest incomes. The lowest incomes tend to be in rural northern, northwest, rural eastern, and rural southern Texas. And we've got, we've got our data now ready to go to start exploring with a minimum of fuss on the data formatting and wrangling side. And so we could take a little peek at our data and I'm gonna walk you through this over on the slides. So we have this plot that we see here, that's great. We're gonna look under the hood now real quick. So what we're working with is a data model called simple features. So around a little bit before Tidy Census, uh, I wrote Tidy Census, um, a number of influential developers within the R community released the SF package, which stands for simple features. You know, SF implements the simple features standard uh, for geometries in R, uh, allowing us to importantly represent spatial data much like it were a regular R data frame. And so if you're new to R, the core data structure in R is a data frame and the Tidyverse team at our studio has um, done a number of things to kind of streamline the process of working with that data. Um, I do see one comment, could not if you see could not find function get ACS, make sure that you are loading tidy, tidy census first. You'll need to do library tidy census first and then try running your code. Um, going back here, I always wanted to be able to work with GIS data the same way I worked with regular tabular data in R. Um, because there's so many amazing tools for working with tabular data in R, but spatial data was always this sort of special thing that you needed special tools for. The SF package for my work was revolutionary because it allowed me and it allowed the R community to work with geographic data just like you would work with any other data set. And Tidy Census couldn't exist without the SF package uh, because this data model is foundational to how Tidy Census works. And so if you look under the hood and type out, say, Texas underscore income, and I'm going to jump back to Posit Cloud and do exactly that. So I'm going to type Texas income. And then we can take a quick peek at what the data look like. We call it a simple feature collection with 254 features and five fields. Those are, that's GIS terminology. Um, so for those of you who are not coming from a GIS background, a feature in a geographic data set is going, you can think of that as a single shape in your data layer. This is something that, you know, when I talk to people from a machine learning background, uh, they use the term features quite differently. Features often represent columns, whereas from a GIS background, features mean rows. So you kind of have to figure out that terminology a little bit. But a feature you can think of as, say, Burnett County, Texas is a county, and the shape of that county, that county itself is a feature. And then a field in GIS terminology represents a data attribute or a column. And so we have 254 counties in Texas. We have more counties by far than any other state in the US. And we have five fields. And walking you through these different pieces, we have a geometry type of multi-polygon. <coughs> so vector spatial data, without going too much into the weeds uh, into kind of GIS data models, 
um, there are two major types of spatial data sets that you'll work with in GIS. And when we're working with census data, you'll largely work with what's called vector data, which if you've ever worked with a vector graphics drawing program, it's analogous to that. It's discrete shapes. So you have points, which are individual locations that are zero dimensional. You have lines, which are one dimensional, kind of connecting the dots. And then you have polygons, which are going to be two dimensional shapes. So they have a perimeter and an area. And we can represent our data, you know, one of these different ways. We can also have something called multi polygons. Census data are often multi, what are called multi polygons, because a multi polygon is where you might have multiple shapes that belong to the same feature. So think about Hawaii, the state of Hawaii. You have multiple islands that aren't contiguous because um, there's ocean in between, but they belong to the same state of Hawaii. And so you want one row representing Hawaii to include all of those different shapes. And so that's what a multi-polygon means. Uh, we have dimension bounding box and a CRS. Uh, may get into that a little bit later today. Um, it's perhaps a touch beyond the scope of today's workshop, but it's really telling you what is the, the extent of our data and what is the coordinate reference system, that's what CRS refers to, of our data, which basically means how are the coordinates that you see here, how are those referenced to the Earth's surface? We need to have some sort of mapping between our data and the actual Earth. Um, the coordinate reference system handles that. And then you see our data. So we return by default a GeoID column here. Uh, that's going to be your census ID, maybe a FIPS code, if you're familiar with that. Um, the first two digits for counties are going to be your state code. Texas is 48. The next three digits are your unique county code. And so um, outside of that, we've got um, Burnett count. We've got the name from the ACS. We've got the variable, which I'll discuss more in a second. An ACS estimate and then the margin of error on the estimate. And that margin of error I mentioned, what we have here is um, the margin of error is going to be representing the, um, what we, the uncertainty around the estimate. And margins of error are, are interpreted as based from, by default in the ACS, it's returned at a 90% confidence level. So you can say roughly, for Burnett County, Texas, I'm 90% sure that the true estimate of median household income is about 65,000 plus or minus about 4,700. And so I'll jump back here to the slides and uh, see one question, by the way, the missing data, this is Loving County, Texas, which is either the smallest or the second smallest county in the US by population. Remembering here that the ACS is based on a survey sample, and Loving County has fewer than 100 people. And so the census does not is not reporting in the ACS a median household income for Loving County because it doesn't have a large enough sample size to do that. And so that's why you see the white there. there we have missing, missing data for Loving County. We can go beyond this. Um, you know, typically, excuse me, we can go beyond this by adding some interactivity. And up until probably three or four years ago, I still hesitated to fully move over my GIS work to R in part because it was challenging to replicate the amazing interactivity of desktop GIS software. You know, one of the great things about desktop GIS software is you open up your spatial data set and you start browsing immediately. I'm clicking around, I'm zooming in, I'm zooming out, I'm exploring my data. That was really powerful to me. That was in one, one of the main reasons I found GIS and geography so compelling in the first place. Wow, I have this interactive map in front of me where I can explore my data in a spatial way, which was intuitive to me. The Map View R package resolved this gap. The Map View R package uh, is a phenomenal package that basically wraps up a lot of interactive mapping tools and allows you to explore your data in a single line of code. Check this out. 
if I go back to our studio and I run this here, I'm going to load map view and I'm going to run this map view function. Optionally, you can put in a Z call. So a Z column, which can be used to create a shaded map, a colored map automatically. So I run this and our studio has this interactive viewer that allows for interactive exploration of our data. And now I'm interactively exploring my data. I hover over, I can see here. So I'm located here in Tarrant County, Texas. The value is 73,545 from the most recent five-year ACS for median household income. I can click and I get a pop-up with all of that information. I see the margin of error. My county is very large, so the margin of error is pretty small. Um, the highest median household income in Texas right now is in Rockwell County at 111,595. The margin of error is larger because the population is smaller. That you can go and change the base map. If you want more of a street map, you can do that. If you want satellite imagery, you can do that. You can turn on and off your data layer if you want. This was transformative to me. And uh, MapView is just an amazing package that we'll be using throughout the workshop today to explore our data interactively. So moving ahead then, I've got in the slides here, a very large interactive map that we can look at. So let's dig in and, and define some of this terminology a little bit better and understand geography and variables. Um, so geography, I did geography equals county before. What exactly does that mean? Well, geographies are foundational to working with spatial data in the ACS because the Census Bureau aggregates ACS data to a variety of different, what we'll call enumeration units. And so you'll have a variety of different kind of entities. Um, we have what are called statistical entities, which are shapes defined by the Census Bureau for aggregation. And then we have what are called um, legal entities, which are entities that actually have legal standing, such as counties and states. Our core census hierarchy is this central axis, starting down at the block level. And the block level is the smallest geography at which the um, census publishes data, but they only publish decennial census data at the block level. You can't get ACS data at the block level. The block group is the smallest geography at which we can get American Community Survey data. And the central axis means that the geographies nest within one another. So block groups nest within a parent census tract, which then nest within a parent county and so on and so forth. You then have all of these other enumeration units or tabulation areas that don't necessarily nest within different geographies, for example, I got a lot of questions last week about zip codes. And one such question was, why can't I get zip code data for a state? Well, zip codes don't actually nest within states. Frequently, they cross state boundaries. And so zip codes only nest within a nation, whereas, say, school districts will nest within a state. And then you have a variety of other geographies as well. Information on how to format those geographies is available in the tidy census documentation. So if I wanted data for county or equivalent, I do geography equals county. And so you can find this information in my book, chapter two. Uh, you can also go to walker-data.com slash tidy census for the tidy census documentation. I have a whole table that describes how to do this. And so if you want, say, census tract data, which I'll show you in a moment, you'll do geography equals tract. If you want block group data, you'll do geography equals block group and so on and so forth. Variables. So once we figure out our geography, we have to figure out our variables. And the finding variables in the ACS can be tricky, admittedly. There are tens of thousands of variables in the ACS. And tidy census accepts unique census codes to get variables. Well, how do you know the census code that you want for the variable that you want? 
Admittedly, this is one of the trickiest parts of working with ACS data, but I include some helper tools in Tidy Census to try to streamline that process. I recommend using the load variables function in Tidy Census. And that function in Tidy Census takes two arguments, a year and a data set. If you put in, say, load variables 2021 ACS5, you'll get the variables from the detailed tables of the ACS. There are also other kind of pre-processed data sets that you can um, that you can grab, such as pre-processed percentages or tabulated data. So those are found in the data profile. To look up variables for the data profile, you use ACS5 slash profile. The subject tables are also great, ACS5 slash subject. You can also look at the comparison profile as well for harmonized change over time. And to show you briefly how this works over in our studio, let's say I want to grab and view variables from the detailed tables for the 2021 five-year ACS. The view command in R, I'm using R's assignment operator here to assign the result of this to an object named bars. I run this command takes a few moments to pull that data down. I then use the view command to show it in an interactive browser in our studio. And so what we see here um, by default are four columns. First, we have a name column. That name is going to be the name of the variable as you would pass it to get ACS. So when you say variables equals something, that's what you're going to use. We then have a label column that tells you in general terms what the variable means. And we have a concept column. So use the label and the concept column together to figure out what your data are. The geography column tells you the smallest geography at which you can get the data. And so if you're ever looking for data and it's all returning NAs, which is the missing value, um, value in R, it means likely that your data aren't available at that geography or for your specific geography, the sample size isn't large enough to return a valid ECS estimate. So this table, sex by age, um, and all these kind of demographic breakouts, that's available down to the block group level. So how do I search? Well, there are two ways to do this. Let's say I'm looking for a median income. I can use the search box to try to look for that. So I could do uh, median income, and I start to get information on median income. I've filtered down from 28,000 entries now to 46. So just a few targeted search queries can be very helpful. You can also use this filter button to filter on the specific labels. So if I wanted to look at income on the label column, I've still got 2,800 to browse, but I can use this filtering along with the search box to do sort of a tailored approach to browsing data. Um, a couple follow-ups. If you really want a great tool to do interactive browsing of ACS variables, censusreporter.org is my favorite place to go. The other piece is sometimes I get questions, well, why can't I, don't you have a feature to, so I can just type in, say, variables equals mail, and I can get information on mails, for example. Well, the problem with that is if I were to filter for see even this estimate total mail, there are so many different variables that have that exact value. So this is why, yes, it can be a little bit tricky, but um, you want to make sure you're browsing and making sure you're working with the exact data that you want uh, before doing your analysis. So you want to do your homework a little bit. So jumping back here to the slides, uh, let's take a look at really where spatial ACS data shine. And this is for small area demographic analysis. So in this particular case, I'm using geography equals tract to get data at the census tract level, which is one of these statistical entities defined by the Census Bureau. They roughly approximate a neighborhood averaging around 4,000 people. 
I put in median household income for the variables. I'm doing state equals Washington, but I also just want a single county here. So I'm choosing county equals king to drill down even further. And if I do that, I'm going to get an interactive map that looks like this, that allows me to see, because King County is very large. It allows me to see much more granular patterns in the distribution of median household income in the Seattle region. And so if I jump back over here, I can run this. I'm going to grab data on income for King County, and I'm going to make an interactive map of it. I get that data almost immediately. And again, notice the beauty of Getty CS here. I can change out different geographies. I can change out different locations and I'm getting my data in a second if I've got a solid internet connection. And I can browse around. I can look here over in Bellevue, over in Sammamish, or in Seattle. I can click. I can see the estimates and margins of error. Of course, for census tracts rather than counties, your margins of error are going to be much higher. Other pieces here as we work our way through this, um, talking about data structure and tidy census. Uh, we're going to be working with a couple of different structures of data in tidy census. And this is particularly important, you know, with respect to working with spatial data. So by default, tidy census returns tidy or long form data, where each row is a geographic unit variable combination, which allows you to stack variable, your variables. For spatial data, this also means that geometries will be stacked, which is sometimes unfamiliar to people coming from a traditional GIS background. So I want to show you a data set on percent race ethnicity for Orange County, California at the census tract level. And I wanna show it to you in two different formats. So we're gonna look at it first here as a long form data set. I'm gonna pull that down and I'm gonna type into my console here, orange underscore race. And you'll notice here that this is a long form data set. It has 2,456 features that is more than there are census tracts, by the way. It's four times the number of census tracts in Orange County because we have a single record for each tract variable combination. So here for this tract, um, which is tract 114.02, we have a row for Hispanic, a row for percent non-Hispanic white, a row for percent non-Hispanic black, and a row for percent non-Hispanic Asian. This is long form spatial data. You don't typically work with that structure in a desktop GIS. The alternative is wide form spatial data, which is much more familiar to how we work with ACS data in a spatial context. I like working with long form spatial data. It enables some pretty interesting analyses, which I'll show you in a moment. But wide form data also works great for a lot of applications. And if you're coming from a GI desktop GIS background, you might want to use that. And so jumping back here to the slides, the distinction is using the argument output equals wide. Um, if you want that wide form data and, and wide form, what that means more specifically is your variables, instead of stacked in the rows, they're spread across the columns, which means you'll get a separate column for each variable or in this, which in this case is a race ethnicity category. So going back to Posit Cloud, I can run this code to make an object named orange race Y. And if I type that into my console, look at how the data are different. So this data set and this data set are the same, but they're just in a different shape. The information is identical, but instead of having a variable that stores the category and then an estimate and a margin of error column, we get separate estimate and margin of error columns for each category. We have here Hispanic. And you know, one thing that I didn't go into it um, detail on, I'm aliasing my variables in the output data here. 
using names. So that's a handy trick if you don't want to have the census variable codes in your output data. So I have Hispanic E, that's the percent Hispanic estimate, and then Hispanic M in a separate column, which is the margin of error around that estimate. White, Black, and Asian all get their own columns now. And so this wide form data only has 614 rows, which is equivalent to the number of census tracts in Orange County. So long form and wide form data, pick which one you like better, pick which one works better for your project. The last bit that I want to show you, and this is something I've got little tricks in each hour of the workshop as we sort of close out this first hour that show how to work with census geometry using a package that I developed called the Tigris package. And Tigris actually precedes Tidy Census. I wrote it originally two years prior to when I wrote Tidy Census. And Tigris is the workhorse that pulls the shape files in from the census website and gets them ready for use in R. Tidy Census uses Tigris to acquire these shape files which by default, we use the census cartographic boundary shape files, which are pre-clipped to the U.S. shoreline. There's also the regular tiger line, the official shape files, uh, which you can get in tidy census as well with the argument CD equals false. How we're going to highlight Tigris today is often not directly, but Tigris includes a number of tools for helping acquire and display spatial ACS data. I'm highlighting one such tool in each hour of the workshop, and these are often tools that are going to make your work with spatial ACS data better. So let's go back to our King County map in the slides here. If any of you are, you know, dialing in from Washington or Seattle, you immediately see something that isn't right here. If you're not from the Seattle area, you might not see it at first, but it's right here. It's Lake Washington. So I mentioned Tidy Census uses these cartographic boundary shape files that are pre-clipped to the US shoreline. The issue here is interior water areas are often not removed. And so the census tracts actually cover water area. You see this area here, Mercer Island, which is right in the middle of Lake Washington between Seattle and Bellevue. By default, it appears that it actually borders Seattle and Bellevue and it's an island and it doesn't. A better display for Seattle would remove those water areas, but how do we even do that? That's a relatively complicated GIS process. But the whole point of working with these tools is to try to make complex processes simpler. There's a function in the Tigris package called erase water. It finds water area shapefiles for you for your area. It completes a GIS process to remove those water areas and it gives you back the result for better cartographic display. Let me show you how this works. You want to make sure you do SF use FS2 false or else the map view command won't work. But this is a whole GIS process that typically takes a while to set up. Erase water does it for you in seconds. And now look at how much better our map is. I zoom in. Mercer Island is there clean as day, or clear as day. Bellevue and Seattle are no longer right next to each other, but we can actually see the extent of these suburban neighborhoods. Um, we're removing water area to get a much more realistic portrait of what the Seattle area looks like. So if you're doing work in water rich areas, and your maps aren't quite right, consider looking at the erase water function. I use it all the time and uh, I'm pretty happy with how it's turned out. All right, so that closes out our first hour. I wanted to go to about the top of the hour. We're gonna take a 10 minute break. And when we return at 2.10 Eastern time, uh, we're gonna delve into making maps. I'm going to take a look at the questions uh, over the break as well and spend a few moments answering them. But while you take your break, stretch your legs, if you want something to do, try a couple of things. Use the load variables function in tidy census. Find a variable that interests you that we haven't used yet. Um, you might want to look in the data profile. So you could do, say, 2021 comma ACS5 slash profile. And then try fetching spatial ACS data. 
for a geography and location of your choice and uh, try mapping it out uh, either with plot or with map view. So um, I'm going to go camera off for 10 minutes. I'll be back at 210 Eastern and uh, answer some of your questions and show you how to make some more maps. All right, welcome back, everyone. Um, let's go ahead and jump into it. Hopefully, you're able to create uh, some interesting visualizations with map view, or at the very least, uh, be able to kind of get some data back. Um, I uh, Unfortunately, I've been trying to answer a number of questions uh, over the chat. Unfortunately, I won't be able to answer every question. You know, one thing that I will mention about the question. So if you have more of a technical question, so like debugging or technical assistance question, that's not something that we can address in the workshop, unfortunately, because there are so many possible reasons why something may be not working that uh, is very difficult to debug live. Um, more thematic questions that are often asked by kind of multiple people. Uh, I'll spend a little bit of time addressing that. And so I see um, a couple questions uh, that, uh, that I want to show you how to do. So I've gotten multiple questions about how do I export the map view map so they can use it in, say, an external presentation. Um, I'll show you how to do that. So Let's say I'm over here in uh, in our studio cloud. So one second. Just going to close a couple tabs and I'm flipping back and forth. So let's say I'm over here in our studio cloud. I have this really cool uh, interactive map of Seattle with erased water. Um, which incidentally, that was one of the questions, you know, someone said, hey, but, you know, how do we get rid of this water area? Bellevue and Seattle look like they're right next to each other. And it is the, right the next thing that we address which is great. Um, so let's say you want to grab this map and you want to export it out. So what I can do here is you'll notice this map view code. What I can do is first things first, um, I'm going to assign it to an object. So I'm going to do king map is the result of that map view. And so instead of displaying it interactively, I'm now assigning it to an object named King Map. And what I'm now going to need is a function called save widget from the HTML widgets package. Anything interactive in R, just about anything, is built on top of this package called HTML widgets. And uh, looks like I, I'm getting a little refresh here. Um, you, you may see that sort of thing. We're using the free version of Posit Cloud. And so if you get a refresh uh, or if you have any memory issues down the line, I'll, I'll talk through that. But we've got, our, we've got our object here named King Map, which you'll notice is a map view map. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do library HTML widgets. And then I'm going to do save widget. The widget I'm saving is King underscore map at map. That is the kind of map, the interactive map part portion of the map view object. And then I specify a file name, king water erased dot HTML, because it'll save as an HTML file. If I run that, This is going to be a reasonably sized file, so it will just take, take a moment to save out. But if I run that, I'm actually building out um, an actual HTML file that is going to be kind of saved in my directory. And so this might be something on the RStudio Cloud side that could be a touch memory intensive for our Studio Cloud. Something I want to give you the heads up about, if you look at this little RAM wheel, you get one gigabyte of RAM for free in our Studio Cloud. If you want more memory, you're going to need uh, you know, a paid version of our Studio Cloud. And so we may have run out of memory. Um, and if that does happen to you, what you may need to do is reboot. This is simply a function of being able to use these free resources. 
this is actually, I'm really glad that I'm showing this right now because that may well happen to you. And um, for one, this is why eventually you wanna install this on your own machines. Uh, but also if this does happen, I'll wanna show you kind of what we'll need to do to repopulate. So this map is a little big, but if you use that same widget, um, it'll write out an HTML file to your computer that you can go and uh, open up and embed in your website as an iframe. So that's kind of handy. Um, other questions. So we're looking at a, a few pieces in here, uh, just for some clarity. I had a question about the GUID column. The GUID column for counties in Texas only had five characters, whereas for census tracts, it has 11 characters. And there's a question about what that means. So the GYD column, you can think of it as for those sh all those shapes in the core census hierarchy, they include all information about parent geographies. And so here, because we're using census tracts, which are smaller than counties, we're going to have a lengthier GYD. The first two characters, that's going to be your state code. So here we have the code 06. The next three characters are going to be your county code. That's 059. And then the next six uniquely identify that census tract within the county. And so that's how you can interpret the GOID. And if you look at chapter two of my book, um, I do have a section in there about understanding GOIDs. All right. So um, I'll keep I'll keep an eye on some of the um, I'll keep an eye on some of the uh, other questions about kind of saving uh, excuse me about um, you know some of these general questions that are coming out and we might be able to address them a little bit later. So jumping back here, uh, we're going to head over to part two mapping ACS data. If you ended up having to terminate your workspace, if you didn't try to save that HTML file, at least when I was running it through, the memory should be able to take you all the way. If for some reason it did get restarted, I'm gonna show you what we'll need to go back and repopulate. So we're gonna spend some time now talking through making maps. And you've already made a couple maps. You've used the base R plot function to make a plot of income in Texas, and then you use map view to make some interactive uh, and pretty attractive looking by default interactive maps. R has emerged as a pretty robust system for cartography. Um, desktop GIS software, in my opinion, this is one area where it can be difficult for a code-based workflow to fully replicate everything that a desktop software platform can do. So if we're talking a graphic design program like Adobe Illustrator or a desktop GIS program, what those allow you to do, given that you're using this graphical user interface to design your maps, is you can manually move things around to exactly the place that you want and then maybe do a little kind of manual touches, that's difficult to replicate. Not impossible, but difficult to replicate in R. Um, however, we're getting a lot closer on the R side. There are a number of excellent packages for cartographic visualization in R. Um, the one we're going to be focusing on today is called ggplot2, which is the second most downloaded R package of all the R packages. And uh, it's the most popular visualization software in R, and it is one of the most popular visualization frameworks in the world. And you can make pretty good looking maps with it. Other options include tmap. Um, I saw one question about tmap in the Q&A. Uh, I cover TMAP in detail, um, replicating a number of these examples using TMAP in chapter six of my book. So if you pick up a copy of my book or if you jump over to the online version, you'll see how to do a lot of this stuff on the TMAP side. I wanted to offer some GGplot2 alternatives in the workshop today. 
Another interesting package, which I haven't personally used, but looks really good. It's built on top of base R graphics. It's called Map SF. So um, jumping back in here, let's talk a little bit about ggplot2. If you've worked with R, you've likely heard of ggplot2. Um, but there's a possibility that if you're new to R, uh, you may not have worked with it before. ggplot2 is R's most popular visualization package. It's been downloaded um, from the R Studio server over 105 million times, which means it's actually been downloaded many, many more times than that, which is a phenomenal number of downloads if you think about it. And in ggplot2, it's inspired by or based on the philosophy of a layered grammar of graphics. That's the grammar of graphics is where gg comes from. And the idea is that you specify a plot um, that's defined by a data set and an aesthetic mapping. So I'll explain to you what an aesthetic mapping is in a little bit. You know, typically, you know, you'll take a column in your data set and you will map it to an element of your chart. It could be the x-axis or a y-axis, or it could be um, the color of shapes on your plot. And then you use one or more geoms, which are types of shapes that you draw. So you might draw a bar or you might draw a line. There's a special geom in ggplot2 called geom sf, which intelligently interprets simple features objects and maps them appropriately. So using familiar ggplot2 syntax, if you come from an R background, you can make pretty attractive maps with the same sort of code and the same sort of layering framework. And I'm going to step you through how to do that. If you want a deeper dive on ggplot2 for visualizing ACS data in a non-spatial way, take a look at the slides from last week's workshop or the video when we post it. And that's one other question I wanted to answer. Some of you have asked for the slides. I did post a link to the slides in the chat and they're also found in the readme of the GitHub repository. So let's jump in here and start mapping some ACS data with ggplot2. What we're gonna need to do first and foremost is jump back here and repopulate our environment because I tried to do a memory intensive operation and I um, exceeded the memory limits of my free posit cloud um, environment. And so I want to grab this orange race object back. So I'm going to need to go back here and reload tidy census and rerun this orange race code to get my race ethnicity percentage data for Orange County. I get that right back. I'll emphasize this. This is the benefit. In many ways, the primary benefit of using a code-based workflow for working with ACS data, demographic analysis, data science, what have you. Let's say your environment crashes. Let's say your system shuts down. If I have code, that shows exactly what I did, all I have to do is boot it up again and I just rerun and I get it right back. This is because I've documented what I've done. And so um, I recover that object. I'm gonna head down here to the part of the script that says mapping ECS data. So what I'm gonna do first and foremost is I'm gonna load in the Tidyverse suite of packages. And the Tidyverse is an integrated set of tools maintained by the POSIT team for data analysis, wrangling, and data visualization. They're all designed to work well together. Uh, last week's workshop focused more heavily on using Tidyverse tools for uh, analyzing and sort of wrangling ACS data. Today, we're gonna to be using some of those data wrangling tools, but mostly focusing on the core visualization package in the tidyverse, which is ggplot2. So when you do library tidyverse, you actually get eight different packages loaded that do a number of different things. And I'll show you some of those, that functionality a little bit later when we're doing some more advanced topics. For now, we're really focusing on using ggplot2. So first things first, um, I wanna make a map of the percent Hispanic population by census tract in 
Orange County, California. And jumping back here to the slides, I'm going to use the filter function, which is a function in the dplyr package to subset my data specifically for those rows where the variable is equal to Hispanic. So you can think of this as similar to a SQL or database query. Give me back those rows from orange race where the variable is equal to Hispanic. Let me show you what this looks like. So here I have my object orange race, just as a refresher of what it is. Orange race has four rows per census tract one row for each census tract for each category. But I just want to make a map of the Hispanic or Latino population. And so I'm going to retain only those rows where the variable is equal to Hispanic by running this code. I run that. And now if I look at my new orange Hispanic object, you'll notice that I'm down to 614 rows. So one per census tract. And I only have variable the, the value Hispanic for each tract. So by default, if you use GeomSF and an aesthetic mapping, where I'm mapping the estimate column, so these values in the estimate column, I am mapping inside this call to AES, I'm mapping that to the, the fill of whatever shape. So the fill color of whatever shape that I'm plotting is going to be proportional to this estimate column, which is the percent Hispanic or Latino from the 2017 to 2021 ACS. The GeomSF function then draws polygons. So in just a couple lines of code, I can make what's called a choropleth map. And here we see it on our screen. And so a choropleth map like this is a map that uses shading to show variation in some sort of data attribute. And so this is the default color palette employed by ggplot2. The lighter areas are used to represent higher values. So those census tracts in Orange County, California that are approaching maybe 90 to 100% Hispanic. And then the darker areas are going to be the lower values. We have what's called a sequential color palette here from low to high. Those darker areas are representing lower values, so areas where there are few Hispanic or Latino residents. So this is great. You get a pretty attractive looking plot um, that you get a pretty attractive looking plot by default. You're likely going to want to do some customization and make this your own. And I'm going to show you how to do this with a variety of different options. So. I start with this as an exploratory graphic. Now I want to start thinking about using some styling. And if you're looking for color palettes to use and you're having trouble finding a color palette to use, uh, the Brewer, the color Brewer um, palettes are all built into ggplot2, as are the Viridis color palettes, which are scientifically derived color palettes that are designed to be perceptually uniform and colorblind safe, which is pretty great. So there are a number of different palettes that you can use. Um, one of my favorites is the Rocket palette. You know, by the way, it's I used the Rocket palette on the cover of my book. So we're going to use the same palette here, um, which is sort of like a, a light red to a dark red. And that's available in this scale fill Veritas C, C for continuous. You pick option equals Rocket to get the Rocket palette. I'm doing a couple other things here. Um, I'm using theme void. Theme void, there are a lot of different themes that you can use in ggplot2. Uh, theme gray is the default, but the thing with theme gray, it includes a lot of other elements. You have the, what's called the graticule here with the coordinates. You may or may not want that. And then you have this gray background, which you also may or may not want. For many simple cartographic visualizations, Theme void is actually really nice because it strips all of that off and it just gives you your data and the legend. I then include using this labs function, a title, a subtitle, a fill, and then a caption. And you'll see how all that plays out. In ggplot2, 
all these elements that are connected by the plus symbol are what we refer to as layers. Those are different layers on the plot. We layer on um, different elements. And let's go ahead and run that. We should get a plot that looks like this. We're using this sort of purple to kind of very light red color scheme. We get a title and a subtitle and we get a caption. So let's go ahead and try that out. I'm going to run this code here. And you'll notice I have gone from this map to this map, where I have included some customization. I have included some important contextual information. Because unless you're from Southern California um, and you're looking at these shapes, you might not know that that's Orange County. So now we're providing some context uh, that, and you can continue to customize and customize and customize on top of this. We, uh, we're scratching the surface here a little bit with these examples, but as you'll see, there's a lot that you can do. Additionally, I might be interested in displaying my data um, in a different way. I think, you know, if you're coming from a GIS background like I did, uh, you're maybe not necessarily immediately saying, oh, I want a continuous color palette to show my data, you're maybe more familiar with using some sort of breaks to bin your data. And maybe we have a few kind of different bins that we'll kind of put uh, data values into. So I can use, I can do a binned choropleth um, with the scale fill viridis B function. And then I can also specify with the end dot breaks argument the number of breaks that I want. And so by default, ggplot2 will identify pretty breaks. So you'll see what that is in a, in a little bit, kind of really intuitive breaks. If you want GIS style, say natural breaks or quantiles, um, you can supply, say, a custom function, or you might want to calculate that separately and then bring in whatever breaks that you want to your map. And so the result will look something like this, where we're breaking in um, in terms of the buckets. We're breaking here at um, 20, 40, 60, 0, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. Those are going to be our six breaks that we're using. And that is then used to form the bins, which forms five bins. And um, you can see kind of the landscape becomes a little bit different. Comparing the two, you get a little bit more context around the heavily Hispanic parts of Santa Ana than you might in a map like this. But, you know, sometimes this is visual overload to have so many different colors. And so it's kind of up to you as a cartographer how you want to do this. As you get a sense with graphic design and cartographic design in particular, I mean, there's there are infinite ways to do this stuff. And I'm just showing you a sampling. So let's go ahead and try that over in R. I'm going to run that through. And we get our binned coral black. So moving back here, I had mentioned before that I really like working with tidy or long form spatial data, which is not typically the data format that you work with in a desktop GIS context. Why do I like this so much? It facilitates group-wise data analysis and group-wise data visualization. And there are a number of tools within the Tidyverse that are really well-suited for group-wise analytic workflows. Talked about some of those in last week's workshop for aspatial data, but if you wanna make group-wise visualizations, which in this case we'll call a faceted plot, long form or tidy spatial ACS data work really well for that with ggplot2. All we have to do to get a faceted plot is we're going to functionally use the same code we used before. We're going to do it over the original orange race object, which includes, again, those four groups that we pulled down. We're then going to add in here facet wrap. We're going to use the facet wrap function to make a faceted plot. We use our little um, tilde sign or squiggly line um, to specify the column that we want to use for faceting, and that's going to be the variable column. And everything else 
it just sort of falls into place after that. And we get a faceted map. So let's talk through this a little bit because there are pluses and minuses to this approach. Um, I'm gonna run that faceted map. I'm gonna go ahead and run this. I'm gonna make the plot bigger. One of the great things about ggplot2 is it returns SVGs or scalable vector graphics by default, which means if you're not that familiar with graphic design, um, vector graphics, they resize, they, um, they're dynamic, they're not fixed. And so this plot viewer, if I resize it, it actually makes my chart bigger and then I can see it a little bit better. So here is a faceted plot. Here we have Asian, uh, non-Hispanic Asian, non-Hispanic Black, Hispanic, and then non-Hispanic White. There are pluses and minuses to this. I mean, the this approach is really nice. Um, we can compare where are where's the Asian population concentrated, uh, where's the Hispanic population concentrated, and where's the white population concentrated in Orange County. Orange County has a relatively small black population in comparison with the other three groups. And so the color scheme used isn't amazing because the black population is topping out at around 15%, which for Orange County is high. But uh, in comparison with the other three groups that are much larger, you don't see much variation in the black population. So you get the, using the common legend, that's helpful because we can compare across. But for some groups, in this case, non-Hispanic Black, it doesn't work quite as well. So you're, there are always pluses and minuses to really think this thing through. So here we have looked at some options for choropleth mapping. Um, what if you want to map your data a different way? Um, data returned from many variables is estimated counts. And we've been mapping percentages. And choropleth maps are well suited for mapping rates or percentages, but they're poorly suited for mapping counts. And why is that? A big reason for that is, and we can go back to say this choropleth map, percentages for these areas make sense because we're adjusting all of our data values for the underlying population of all these areas. And so in this particular case, you know, oftentimes if you're making a coral pleth map, for census tracts, we try to keep them around the same population, but an issue that'll come up is you might have an area like this that is a lot bigger than some of the census tracts over here in Santa Ana. And so naturally, our eyes will gravitate toward the larger areas. And let's say you're making a county map. In some cases, like larger counties, maybe they will reflect a different denominator of population than a smaller county will. That's not always the case. It can be. Um, but it also kind of implies something visually that makes it difficult to make comparisons specifically of counts because in this case at least I'm looking at percentages but if we had count data here I'm trying to now compare the count of an area with another area but at the same time if I had like a hundred people here and a hundred people here that's a whole lot more space that's occupied by that a hundred people than it is by this a hundred people on the plot. And so you want to have some sort of consistency in your representation of symbols when you're working with count data. And so you absolutely should and can map count data, but coral pleth maps are not the best way to do it. I'm going to illustrate a couple alternatives uh, that are better suited for count data, for mapping count data, and how to do that in ggplot2. So we're going to need to grab some count data. And one great thing about using the data profile for many variables if you have a variable and you stick a P on the end of it, that'll give you the percentage with an appropriate denominator for that variable. So what we're doing here is we're just creating a new object named orange race counts. Same as the orange race, but our values, let me show you what it looks like. Our values are going to be estimated counts rather than estimated percentages. So I'm going to type here orange race counts. 
And you'll notice here the estimates are no longer percentages, but rather they are estimated counts with a margin of error around those counts. So we're going to make a couple types of maps with count data. One such map is going to be, jump back here, a graduated symbol map. And a graduated symbol map is better for count data because the actual comparisons that we're making are between symbols of the same shape. So often you use circles for this, uh, but you can use other symbols as well if you want. And the relative size of the symbol is going to be relative to or proportional to the underlying data value. And so in ggplot2, you have to convert your data first to make graduated symbol maps because we're starting with polygons. Our data are represented as polygons. We need to convert our census tracts to points. I mentioned different geometry types in the first part of the workshop. Polygons are going to be enclosed shapes that have a perimeter and an area. But if we want to be mapping circles, we're going to want to convert those polygons to single locations and then draw circles at those locations rather than try to deal with the whole polygon shape. We're going to use the an underlying function in the SF package, which is giving us our simple features data model. We use a couple of these functions in this workshop. Our function is called stcentroid. And without getting too much into the GIS terminology, it puts, it, it converts the shape of say a given census tract to a dot or a point right in the center of that census tract. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a new object called orange black, um, cause we're gonna make a graduated symbol map of the black population in Orange County. We convert that to centroids. We're converting that to points. So let's go ahead and try that out. I'm gonna run this code. We get a warning that says, you're assuming attributes are constant over the geometries of X. What does that mean in a less technical sense? It's saying, hold on a second. Just wanna tell you, you're taking this big polygon and you're changing it to a point. And that point is in a location that might not actually be where the people live. So just be careful about that. If you're implying that the people live where the point is, well, they might actually live in some other part of the census tract. So just a heads up, that's what it's telling us. Once we have that information in hand, however, we can start to make a layered map. And what we're gonna do here is we're going to use two successive calls to GeomSF to stack our circles on top of the polygons, because it's nice to have those polygons as a reference layer to know what the circles belong to. So I'm going to first draw the shapes, excuse me, draw the polygons, so the census tracts. Then I'm gonna draw my circles using the size aesthetic. So I'm drawing circles. The size is gonna be proportional to the underlying data value. I'm gonna put in some contextual information and then I'm gonna use this scale size area function what that does is it plots proportional rather than graduated symbols. So graduated symbols, uses sort of predefined shape sizes and then puts different values into buckets. Whereas proportional symbols actually try to make the symbols on the map proportional to one another. And let me show you what that looks like. So for zero, we have this tiny little dot. And you can see for our categories here, 250, 500 and 750. So the area of this circle should be about half of the area of this circle. And so the circles, ggplot2 tries to make them proportional. They won't be perfectly proportional, but ggplot2 tries to do that. And so the areas with the larger circles are going to be locations with more non-Hispanic Black people living there. And the areas with the smaller circles, you can see some of these big tracks out here, have very few Black people living there. So let's go ahead and run that code and see what we get back. So here's our plot. And as you can see here, we're direct, we're comparing the locations of the shapes, but also can directly compare the size of the shapes. And so that's what makes this 
better suited to count data because we're not referencing that back to the overall big shape. You see this really big shape here, instead of filling that all up with a single color that represents a count, we can have this tiny little dot that's much more directly comparable to these other circles. So that's a graduated symbol map. Um, the next map that I want to show you for mapping count data is the dot density map, which is one of my favorites. Showing heterogeneity, so multiple categories on a map, is traditionally pretty difficult because the more stuff you put on a map, the harder it is to understand any particular theme. And so with respect to race ethnicity, if I'm showing, say, percent Hispanic, I'm not necessarily getting a huge sense of diversity, of mixing of groups, of how different groups live together. And so dot density mapping, especially categorical dot density mapping, tries to resolve this. There are a number of pitfalls with sort of traditional workflows for dot density mapping, however. You know, one is traditionally it's been kind of cumbersome or slow to compute these dots. And second, you'll often see with some dot density implementations for categories. So you'll have a bunch of dots scattered. Each dot is proportional to some data value. The dots might be colored re relative to some category, but you'll see stacking of categories. You'll have all the dots for say white on the bottom and then all the dots for black and then all the dots for Asian. And this can sort of make some categories occlude other categories. So I wrote a function in tidy census called as dot density to try to resolve these problems. It's designed for categorical mapping of, uh, of uh, ACS data, census data as dot density maps. Uh, it takes in data in long form. And so as dot density, we take a data set here. We specify a value that we want to use to govern that dots to data ratio. The values per dot says approximately plot one dot for every 200 people, and that's adjustable. And then we can also specify a grouping variable if we want to. And what that'll do is create separate dots per group. So to show you how this works, I can run this. It runs reasonably quickly. There's a lot of calculations that are happening under the hood here. What it's doing is it's randomly scattering dots within each census tract proportional to the number of people that are in each group defined in that variable column. Our output data set, orange race dots, looks like this. It's a geometry type point. We've scattered over 15,000 dots, which um, is roughly representative of kind of that uh, that dots to data ratio that we have figured out. And you'll notice that we shuffle the ordering of the dots. ggplot2 will plot the dots in the order of these that the rows appear. So we shuffle the ordering of the dots such that we can try to represent and visualize mixing and prevent dot occlusion. We can then pass that to this, basically the same sort of plotting workflow that we did before, where I'm substituting my centroids for my dots. I'm specifying a very small dot size. I'm using um, a coloring function to use one of the color brewer, the famous color brewer cartographic palettes for categorical data. And then I'm using this special bit of code which I'll show you what it looks like with and without it, to blow up the dots in the legend so I can actually see them. Let me actually show you what this looks like without this override.aes argument. So by default, my dot density map is going to look like this. It works, and you can see how the dots are scattered, but that legend really difficult to see because those dots are actually the same size as the dots on the map, 0 0.01. And so, 0.01, excuse me. 
So I can override that size and plot the dots as size three. And by doing that, it blows up the dots in the legend and makes it much more visible. So that's a handy trick for dot density mapping. All right, so that takes us through um, these uh, basically core static mapping examples. I wanna walk you through a, a specific use case that you'll likely come across that shows how the methods that you've learned here might not work for every map of ACS data. And so in this particular case, moving through here, let's say you, um, well, a couple pieces that, that are pretty cool that I wanna show you. So for interactive maps with map view, you can put in, let's say you wanted to use the rocket color palette. You can actually define using the Viridis light package you can define a custom color palette. You can define a custom layer name. I'll tell you something I do a lot in my work is if I am, and I'm gonna need to call in library map view here. If I'm trying to generate a bunch of maps that have a nice looking base map beneath it like this for a presentation, often what I'll do is I'll customize map view slightly like this. I'll take a screenshot of this and I'll plug it into my Google Slides or my PowerPoint. Um, that is, I think, a pretty reasonable way to have a really nice looking map with a base map. And if I need to zoom in, like let's say I wanna do in Google Slides, show all of Orange County, and then I wanna show Santa Ana, I zoom in, screenshot that, it works really well. And there are lots of other really cool tricks that you can do. Let me show you this one. This one's really fun. The Leaf Sync package, allows you to kind of put together multiple maps. So in this particular case, as I have over here on the slides in map view, you can actually stack layers with the plus operator and you can, or you can swipe between them with the pipe operator. Let me show you how this works. So I'm gonna make two maps. You know, one is going to be my, or a map of Hispanic and one is going to be a map of non-Hispanic white. White. I'm going to assign each of those two variables. So I'll have M1 and M2. So check this out. Let's say I want to do a swipe map between Hispanic on one side and white on the other side. I can type in M1 pipe M2. Looks like I'll need an extra package for that leaflet.extras2. Um, if you, if you want to go in and install that package, you can, uh, feel free to do that. I would encourage you to do that. And then maybe, um, you know, try that out on your own computer. I want to get to some of these other examples. The sync function is really fun. I'm going to load in leaf sync here. And I run this sync function and what it does is it creates, I'm going to make this bigger side-by-side -side synced maps where I can zoom in and you'll notice the other map zooms to the same spot and gives me a little circle that shows where my cursor is on the other map. So if you want to do side-by-side -side exploratory mapping, this is pretty great. There are so many tools that you can draw from in R to really explore your data in a pretty rich way. The last example I want to get into before the break is going to be a common use case that we'll run into when working with and trying to map ACS data in R. And this is another way the Tigris package can come in and help. Common use case, I wanna make a map of the entire United States, maybe at the state level or the county level or some other geography. And I'm gonna use MapView for that. I'm gonna try that out. So here I'm gonna pull down data on median age. That this is the data on median age. I'm going to use survey equals ACS1 for the one year ACS rather than the five year. And then I'm going to use map view to, to plot that. The map by default was well, not great. Alaska is massively inflated. And in fact, the Aleutian Islands cross the 180 degree um, 
line of la longitude. And so part of Alaska is way over here on the right and the rest of Alaska is way over here on the left. That's not great. If I wanna compare Alaska, Alaska is big. It's not this big. We're using a projection uh, here called the Mercator projection or a variant of that called Web Mercator that grossly inflates the area of regions near the poles. Now Mercator is really nice. For Google Maps, like if I'm in my town of Fort Worth and I'm trying to figure out how to find a restaurant to get to, Mercator um, will preserve basically north is up and west is left and south is down and so forth. So it's great for local navigation. That's why Google Maps has traditionally used it. But for coral plant mapping of the US, not great. So you might want to look at a different approach. I wrote a function in Tigris called shift geometry to try to resolve this. It gives you an opinionated set of tools for moving Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico to other locations so you can actually display them all at once. You gotta be careful with this. You can't use that object for spatial analysis because Alaska and Hawaii and Puerto Rico are no longer gonna be proportional. But for cartographic display, it works really nicely. So let me show you how this works. I'm going to do shift geometry, and I'm going to shift the geometry of state age, and then I'm going to plot my data using ggplot. So instead of Alaska way out here, I'm moving Alaska with the Aleutians down below. I'm shrinking it. I'm moving Hawaii over here underneath Texas. I'm moving Puerto Rico over here and inflating it so I can actually make some reasonable comparisons. And it's interesting, if I were to go in and use state age instead of age shifted, this would be my ggplot. Again, not great. I've got the Aleutians way over here and all of this white space. I don't want that. This is a much better representation. And so shift geometry allows you to do that. But let's say you want some interactivity. Something that you can do is add in some extra interactive code using ggraph. And you know this is something that um, I highlight in my book. One thing that's really cool about it is what ggraph will do, it includes a method called geomSF interactive that you can use to make your shapes interactive. This was something that um, if you're using the posit cloud environment, the, there may be some memory limitations uh, that make some of the interactivity a little bit difficult to display. Uh, so I'm not going to go ahead and show that um, example right here. But if you're trying this out on your own computers, do try that out. Uh, in fact, in my book, and I'll, I'll show you an example of this um, real quick. It's um, So my book in chapter six, just to kind of show you what that can look like, is you can get a plot that looks like this, where you can hover your cursor. Here's an alternative view of shift geometry, by the way. You can hover your cursor over a state, and you're going to get a little tool tip. And so here you still have interactivity but you're not having to use that Mercator projection. So I'd encourage you to try this out. I'm gonna post a link directly to that part of the chapter in the chat. And I'd encourage you to take a look at that. So it's been a lot here that we've gone through. Um, many, many options for interactive mapping in, uh, in R, looks like. Pause the screen sharing, pull that back. Let's go ahead and, and break until 10 after the hour. So we'll break until 310 Eastern and try some stuff out. You know, go ahead and look in the data profile to find another percentage variable and try to get some spatial ACS data for uh, your variable. You can repurpose some of the code, say from Orange County if you want to, or try a different location in the US. 
try to make a customized choropleth map with ggplot2. If you have some time, try making a customized interactive map. You could try out ggiraffe or you could try out map view. So play around with that a little bit. And again, chapter six of my book goes into even more depth on a lot of these topics. And so if you feel like you'd kind of like to learn a few more things, uh, take a look at chapter six. It'll show you how to do it in some alternative mapping platforms like TMAP, but also expand on some of these examples. So I'm going to go dark for 10 minutes and I'll see you for part three. All right. Um, welcome back, everyone. And wow, thank you. 200 of you have stuck around for hour three. So I really appreciate you spending this amount of time uh, with me and uh, in learning about some of these tools. So um, I've been trying to answer some of the more specific questions over on the Q&A. Uh, there are a couple questions that have been repeated. And so I want to address that uh, with you live. So I'm going to jump back here um, to Posit Cloud and show you a, a couple examples that have come up. So um, one such example was I'm trying to get data for Houston, Texas, which is in Harris County, uh, largest county in, in my state of Texas. And they're getting an error message. Let me show you what that error message says and why you're getting it and how you resolve it. Because this does come up for a few other counties around the country. So let's say I wanted to get median household income data for Harris County. What I'm actually going to do is I'm going to copy paste this uh, King Income code here. I'm just going to take it back down here and because I want to show you a couple things. So here I've got my King Income code. I'm going to change it to Harris Income. So tracked level, median household income. State equals Texas, county equals Harris, geometry equals true. Uh, we're defaulting to 2021. So I'm going to try running that. And I get an error message. Your county string matches Harris County and Harrison County. Please refine your selection. So why did that happen? Well, when we put in Harris, basically we try to do intelligent string matching to translate county names to county codes because one major benefit of using tidy census in my opinion is that you don't need to remember the FIPS codes for states or counties. You can just put in the postal code or the name for a state and you can put in the name for a county. So we have lookup tables. We use lookup tables and we do sort of string matching under the hood to do that translation which works in most cases, but in cases like Texas, which has 254 counties, you'll find some strings that actually match multiple counties. And in this particular case, um, when it says, please refine your selection, this is what you do. Instead of typing Harris, you'll need to type Harris County, add county. So you do that, It will work. And now I can go in. I'm going to make a little ggplot. Let's do a coral plef here. I'm just going to show you how you can change this, change this around. So I'm copying and pasting this code, but I'm going to change to Harris Income. I'm going to make it. Uh, median household income, Harris County, Texas. I'm going to run that code. And now I've got a map of median household income. I could probably stand to do a little bit more cleanup, uh, but here you can, uh, you can get a, a sense of how that works. So now we can see that the Harris County piece. And then a couple other people asked, how do you export this to an image file to use in other projects? 
there are multiple ways to do this and I'll show you how to do it. So start with the quick and dirty way. If I'm in a hurry, this is what I do. Right click, save image as. And you'll, you won't see my save as prompt pull up because we're, I'm just sharing my Chrome tab, but that is your quick and dirty way to do it. And you can save it as an image file. Second way, you can use the export button in our studio to export. You can choose save image, image or save as PDF. And there, there's going to be a dialog that you can use and you can save out your image that way. The third way is to do it programmatically, which gives you the most fine grained control over it. And there's a function in ggplot2 called ggsave. What ggsave does is it either saves out the most recently displayed plot or a specific plot to an image file. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to um, assign my ggplot of Harris income to a plot named um, Harris plot. So I'm going to save that. And so now I have an object named Harris plot. I'm going to call now the ggsave function. And so ggsave, you'll look at all these arguments here. File name, that's going to be the output file name of my plot. So I'm going to type in uh, Harris income dot PNG. Uh, the plot is going to be Harris plot. And then I can choose a scale. I can choose a DPI for the resolution, so dots per inch. I can specify the background because um, you know by default I, you get a transparent background, but if I want a white background, I could do BG equals white. And after doing all that, if I run this code, it saves out the image, and you'll notice in my files browser I now have a graphic named Harris Income PNG. In our Studio Cloud, um, I can go ahead and uh, click on that file and then click export, and I can then download that to my computer. So that's uh, those are the three workflows for saving out an image as a static file. All right, so we've got uh, close to 45 minutes left. Uh, let's get right into it and jump into application segregation, diversity, and spatial analysis. All right, so if you're coming into this, there are going to be questions about working with ACS data. So we've focused on sort of general use cases, downloading the data, getting it ready for display and analysis, interactively browsing your data, and then using ggplot2, which you may be using in other projects already, to make a variety of different maps that are going to be the default expectation of what you're able to do in a desktop GIS program. And moving forward, as you get more experience with this, you might be thinking about, I'm trying to study this or this topic or that topic. How do I actually fit the data that I now know how to acquire into a real world workflow? You know, to, you know, try to solve this research project that I'm doing or try to solve this business use case that I have or solve a public health problem that I'm working on, depending on what your job is. I mean, the possibilities are really limitless and we can only go so far, but the amazing thing about working with R is you have this integrated ecosystem of tools that allows you to take the data that's coming in, say from Tidy Census and the visualization tools that you're working with, say, with say a ggplot2, and potentially connect that to more sort of domain specific workflows. So I'm going to look at a couple of use cases here. One is going to be more in the area of social science research, um, you know, in the spirit of giving the talk through the University of Michigan and SSDN. And then the other is going to be more of a location analytics, maybe business analytics use case. And this scratches the surface. There are so many other options that you could take a look at. I elaborate in chapter seven and eight in my book on a lot of things that you can do but the sky's the limit for what you can imagine. So let's take a look first at analyzing segregation and diversity. And um, apologies for throwing a math formula up on the board. Uh, that's just for reference. We're, we're not 
going to worry about that in tremendous detail, but uh, do want to talk through the topic of studying segregation. And so, you know, honestly, in many disciplines, the topic of segregation is one of the most studied topics there is. And so segregation is studied with census data, with ACS data, and arguably the most common metric for studying segregation, which we can define as the relative separation of two or more groups in geographical space, is the dissimilarity index. And the dissimilarity index is representative of, so you'll, to calculate a dissimilarity index, you need a, a region under study. This could be a county, this could be a metro area, this could be a state. And then you need some unit of analysis. Often that will be the census tract. And your output statistic D is going to be basically the percentage of people or a group's population that would need to move to achieve evenness with respect to the overall regional population. So, you know, if you have, um, let's say, 70% uh, one group and 30% uh, the other group in a region, um, but that's going to vary within different census tracts, the dissimilarity index will say, well, this many this percentage of people need to move to match that overall kind of 70-30 distribution. So for every census tract to also be 70-30. And so D is calculated with this formula. Basically, um, you kind of look over all of your units, which we denote as I. We look at the group, um, the group value for group A relative to the overall group value. Um, in the region, we look at the local value for B relative to the overall value. We um, look at the difference, take the absolute value, sum over that and divide by two. That's our dissimilarity index. And a great thing about R, you don't need to do this math yourself. There are tools that allow you to calculate this that already integrate with tidy census. And I want to show you how they work. So the segregation R package, which is a reasonably new package, and there are other packages for calculating segregation in R, but this one is my favorite because it really is designed in a way to talk to modern methods of doing data analysis. So within frameworks like the tidyverse. And so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna take my orange race counts object and I'm going to use this filter command, and I'm going to use this special operator called in, so that I retain only those rows that have either white or Hispanic as their, their group identifier. So I'm looking at segregation between non-Hispanic white and Hispanic populations by census tract in Orange County. I am then going to use this pipe operator, which I haven't talked about yet. The pipe operator and there are two pipe operators in R. This is the classic uh, Magritte pipe, which is typically used within the tidyverse. You can read it as that. So I'm designing an analytic workflow here. So I start with my orange race counts. Then I filter that data set. So I subset it or do a SQL style query where the variable is in this vector of values. And functionally that means or the variable is either white or Hispanic. Then I calculate for that derived data set, the dissimilarity index, where my group is going to be variable, and that's going to define if it's, you know, white or Hispanic, those are the groups. The unit of analysis is going to be the, the census tract, and our GOID column uniquely denotes census tracts. And then my weight is going to be the population value, or at least the estimate of it contained in the estimate column. Let's try this out. So I'm gonna jump back over here to Posit Cloud. I'm gonna run this through. Calculates immediately. I don't need to specify the math myself. The dissimilarity index is about 0.52. So that means about 52% of, uh, of people would need to move uh, to achieve overall evenness. And you can really see that. I mean, when we looked at our plots, just jumping back here to the faceted plot,
you could really see that. Um, the white population, non-Hispanic white, much larger along the coast in Orange County, smaller in the interior, whereas the Hispanic population, much larger in the interior and much smaller along the coast. So uh, you do see relative segregation between those groups in Orange County. So I had mentioned this before, one of the great things about working with demographic data from tidy census in long form is it facilitates group-wise data analysis. Segregation analysis is interesting in and of itself, but where it gets the most interesting, in my opinion, is when you're analyzing this data by group. And so a group-wise data analysis requires identifying salient groups in your data and then computing the same analysis for each of those groups. Tidyverse analytic tools allow you to do that without having to go through the cumbersome process of separating out your data by hand and then calculating a statistic individually for each group. If we had four or five groups, maybe that's not a huge deal. If you have, let's say, a thousand groups, nobody wants to do that by hand. So a group-wise analytic workflow ends up being really powerful. So let's grab some data for four counties in the Los Angeles region to do this sort of analysis. So I'm making a new object called LA Race Counts. And I'm going to grab those races and see counts at the track level. And this, the same way, I'm going to do it for multiple counties. So something I haven't shown you before, if you want multiple counties at once, you can specify a vector defined by C and with values separated by commas for multiple county names. I'm grabbing for Orange County, but also Los Angeles County, San Bernardino County, and Riverside County. So four of the counties in the LA region. And then I'm using a tool that I introduced last week from the Tidyverse, but I haven't touched on today. The separate function is really handy because it can take a column of data and then parse it out into multiple columns based on a separator. And one great thing about the name column that comes through in Tidy Census by default is it separates out different elements of the name of a location by a comma and a space. So if you take a look at, say, a census tract. So if I go back here and I just type in like orange race counts and I take a look at it, if we look at the name column here, we get a separation out here where we've got tract and county and state. And I actually have this flipped around in the code. You'll want to separate that out into tract, county, state. And in this particular case, we will then get an output. Let me show you how this works. An output that gives you a single column for the track name, a single column for the county name, and a single column for the state name. So we start here with orange race counts. If I run the separate function, let me pull this down for all of Los Angeles, separate that out. And again, notice that uh, I had a little typo in my code. Track should go first, then county, then state. So here I have a tract column, a county column, and a state column. And so using this information, say we see here the county column, I can use the county as a grouping variable. And so a really interesting function in the tiny versus called group modify, where you can functionally take a set of groups and then pass that to a function that basically calculates the fun, you know, some sort of process over a set of groups and then reassembles the result. And so by running this type of code, now this is more advanced code. We're stepping up a little bit because we're trying to do domain specific workflows. There's a little bit of extra R here that where we're taking a leap. So this is something that if this is a little bit uncomfortable, that's totally okay. I would say um, I explain this stuff in much more detail in chapter eight of my book, but also um, this is an interesting, just think of this as introducing some, some tools that 
through your R learning journey could end up being really useful to you down the line. And so using group modify here, I can calculate group-wise dissimilarity for each county. And now I can look at the differences in the dissimilarity indices by county. And so from a segregation standpoint, LA County among these four is the most segregated between Hispanic and white populations. Orange County comes in second. Riverside County has the lowest segregation among these four counties between white and Hispanic populations at the census tract level. So that is calculating segregation. So segregation between two groups. What if you wanna consider an alternative approach and think about diversity? And so we're, we've talked about already kind of relative separation between groups. How do we calculate and analyze how groups are mixed together? We've thought about ways to visualize that intuitively with a categorical shuffle dot density map using that as dot density function that uh, is um, that I wrote in tidy census. What if we want to create an index, an index that calculates the level of mixing, so to speak, within a given neighborhood. Now, granted, there are always going to be scale issues with this. There's a whole body of work within geography and allied disciplines that say, well, you might have diversity at the tract level, but if you actually look at the block group or the block level, it turns out that different groups are living apart, but within the same tract. So that's always something you need to take into account. That said, the entropy index, which is also implemented in the segregation package, is a pretty great way to think about calculating diversity. And I get this question a lot, by the way, from journalists. Journalists are always contacting me saying, I want to understand how to show diversity. Like, how can I, um, I'm reporting on diversity and, you know, mixing of groups in my region. How do I calculate that? Um, you know, the entropy index is a great way to do this because you can actually modify the entropy index in a reasonably intuitive way. So the standard formula is you basically, for a given location, you take a look at the kind of group distribution and um, you'll use kind of the natural log of the, the inverse of that, of the group's distribution. Uh, multiply that by a given group's distribution and then sum over the groups to, uh, you know, figure out what that index is. A modification of that, however, the default is to take the natural log, but if you replace that natural log with the base K log, where K is the number of groups, you actually create a range of diversity scores from zero to one, where sort of complete evenness is one, you're maximizing the output at one. So for four group entropy, because we have four groups in our calculation here, we can specify in this entropy function, which implements this formula in the segregation package, if we do base equals four, we actually get an index between zero and one, where zero is going to be the least diverse and four is going to be the most diverse. So in this particular case, entropy is calculated element-wise. So it's calculated over each, um, say, for a specific location, like a census tract. So in this case, we're using we're grouping by our GUID, by grouping by our census tract. And then we're using group modify to make a data set that we're going to stitch together um, of entropy scores or diversity scores for Orange County. And so let's go ahead and try running that code and see what we get back. It'll take a few moments to compute. I guess not that long, because um, we are iterating over all of the tracks in Orange County. And we can look at Orange Entropy. And I'm actually going to do a little trick. If you do control click on a given object, it uh, will pop it out in your data viewer in our studio. And you can see here, we have our tracked ID and we have our entropy index or our diversity scores. So we have Way up here, this is the most diverse census tract in Orange County with an entropy score of uh, 0.938. And then we have here, this tract here likely has no people living there or very few. 
And so reasonably, the lowest one is going to be uh, 0.08. That's going to be our least diverse census tract. So this is interesting in and of itself, but you know, this particular workshop is all about spatial data and making maps. So it's probably the most interesting if we actually go and make a map of this information. So what I'm showing you here is how you might grab some of these shapes to attach data sets together. I got one question about this earlier. I mentioned that tidy census uses the Tigris package when you use that argument geometry equals true to fetch the census shape files and do the internal merging. In some cases, you're going to bring your own data that maybe is aggregated at the track level. Maybe it's public health data from a local public health department that's aggregated at the track level. And you want to bring that in and you want to map it using some of the methods that you've learned today. Well, geometry equals true doesn't work for that. You need to go a step lower and actually grab those census, census tract shapes from the Tigris package. The Tigris package is designed to include a series of functions that correspond to different census geographies. Chapter five of my book tells you all you need to know about the Tigris package for today. We're going to grab a tracts data set using the tracts function for Orange County. This is what tidy census calls under the hood. So if I specify using the tracts function, the state is California, the county is orange, year is 2021 to align with our ACS data. CB equals true gives us that cartographic boundary shape file, pre-clipped to US shoreline for a coastal county like Orange County, that's what we're gonna want. And then the left join function in the tidyverse joins your entropy data, so our computed index, to our track data. So you can think about this as our census tracts are the left-hand side of a table join. On the right-hand side of our table join, that's going to be our entropy indices. We specify a key field with by, so we're joining by GUID, which is our census tract ID, and that stitches the data sets together. It merges them or joins them like you would in SQL, or like you would in, say, an ArcGIS or a QGIS. So to show you how that works, I'm going to run these two lines of code here. We're going to pull in our data. It just takes a moment. I can take a quick peek at my data. Now, by default, there are a lot of different columns that come in from Tigris. You have all sorts of IDs. You actually have land and water area. Um, so those are columns you might not necessarily need. Tidy census by default dismisses those columns, though you can keep them with the argument keep geo bars equals true. But here we have the shapes in Orange County with our entropy indices. And with that in hand, we can make a map. And here you go. Here's your map of diversity in Orange County. The most diverse areas are look to be up here, kind of in the Northwest, maybe in the interior, Santa Ana, heavily Hispanic, lowest diversity, but also some of these predominantly white communities along the coast are also very low diversity. And so I can do this, or also I can use map view. If I wanted to go in and do map view, um, you know, orange diversity geo, D call equals entropy. I can do that. And now I've got an interactive browsable map of diversity scores where if I want to say, well, what are these low diversity areas? So it's like Newport Beach, relatively low diversity. The high diversity areas, we kind of zoom around up here. We've got Cyprus, we've got kind of western parts of Anaheim. Those are the highest diversity areas. So we can interactively browse our data and do sort of an iterative analysis accordingly. So those are some metrics for doing um, some social science research tasks in R using an add-in like the segregation package. And yes, we do require some more sophisticated analytic functionality, but one of the great things about using R is the actual math behind it. And the math can sometimes get somewhat sophisticated. The math gets wrapped up for us 
in these relatively straightforward functions like dissimilarity or entropy. So we don't have to go in and compute it ourselves. I remember I wrote an article several years ago that was implementing entropy indices. And I wrote a formula to do that by hand. The segregation package didn't exist at the time. Now, if I were doing that, I would go straight to the segregation package and, uh, and not have to worry about implementing that by hand. So he, again, here's our map. In the last topic that we're going to be covering today, we're going to be discussing spatial analysis with ACS data. This is a massive topic that we're only going to scratch the surface of. And I'm going to focus on two specific use cases. You know, spatial analysis refers to the analysis of data in a way that explicitly takes into account its spatial properties. We weren't doing explicitly spatial analysis in our segregation and diversity analytics. Yes, we were thinking about it sort of in a spatial adjacent way by saying, well, where are high or low diversity scores? Let's make a map of this. Let's think about mixing within a geographic unit like a census tract. But what I mean by spatial analysis is actually taking into account spatial relationships where you might have a, a variable in your analysis that is, where is this tract located? What census tracts neighbor that census tract and how is that meaningful? And we're going to do kind of two such applications. One is gonna be kind of pre-written for you. One is gonna be kind of on the fly interactive using a brand new feature uh, that many of you who have been using Toddy Census for some time, you may not even know about it. And so it goes without saying, I know I've said this a few times, but spatial analysis is a huge topic. There's a ton that you can do with it. And take a look in particular at chapter seven and chapter eight of my book for a lot more examples. Today, we're going to look at two things. We're going to complete a spatial analysis workflow to identify neighborhood hotspots. So where do you see diversity, like high diversity scores surrounded by other high diversity scores? Where do you see kind of low diversity scores clustering together in Orange County? And then we're going to look at maybe an applied use case. I want to analyze demographics within a given proximity of a site. We know how to pull demographics for counties. Uh, but what if I want something that's more custom? How do I do that? We're going to take a look at that in just a moment. So in the first example, we're going to look at a workflow for identifying hotspots. And there are a lot of different metrics that we can do for neighborhood hotspot analysis. But first and foremost, we need to adopt some sort of definition of what a neighborhood is. So a neighborhood in a spatial analysis context refers to a given unit of analysis, so it might be, say, a single census tract. Let's start there. And then other census tracts that are nearby. And that constitutes then a neighborhood. Well, how do you know what nearby means? That is something that's sort of vague. And nearby could mean, say, a short distance away from a location. It could mean basically the closest neighbors to a location. We know in rural areas, distances mean a different thing than they do in urban areas. When we're working with polygons or shapes like census tracts, it could be neighborhoods based on what we'll call contiguity. And contiguity we define as other locations or other, say, census tracts that touch a given census tract. And so and when we're using contiguity-based neighbors, we can think about well, what does that mean? You can have what are called queens-based neighbors, where a neighbor shares a, at least one single point. So think about the four corners in the United States, where you've got Colorado, Utah, Arizona, and, uh, and New Mexico, and, and there's like a, a, single, a single point where they all come together, and that's your four corners. Um, are the, are states that kind of come together at those four corners, uh, but only share a single point neighbors or not? Uh, so Colorado and Arizona, do they border each other? Well, that's an excellent question. Um, under a Queens case definition, they do. Under a Rooks case definition, they don't. And so 
what we're going to do is do kind of a step-by-step -step process. This is a much bigger topic than we have time to cover today, but I'm going to step you through how you can apply this with, frankly, a minimum of code. And so first things first, we're going to jump back here and we're going to use the workhorse package in R for spatial neighborhood analytics, and that's the SP depth package. I'm going to load that in. My first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to define a neighbor's object. I'm going to use the poly2nb function over my orange diversity geo data set. I set queen to true. And what that means is I'm using queen's case neighbors. So just to show you what that means. Look at these census tracts there. Look at this tract highlighted here and this tract highlighted here. Should those be considered neighbors or not? They only share a single point right here. A queen's case definition says, yes, they are neighbors. If I did queen equals false and I did rook's case neighbors, they would not be considered neighbors. So I run that through and I get what's called a neighbors list object. We haven't talked about lists as a data structure in R, and that's really beyond the scope of what we're doing today. But if I look at neighbors and I look at the first element of neighbors, this is the first census tract. It gives me the row indices of the other census tracts that border it. So I've just calculated out for a given census tract number one, so the first one in my data set, the 9th, 416th, 493rd, and 494th census tracts are neighbors of it. Similarly, I could look at the second census tract, and that borders, again, four census tracts, but they're entirely different ones. I can take that to then make a spatial weights object, which formalizes those relationships. It gives a weight to each neighbor of a given census tract, and then it basically says the weight is zero or not a neighbor of um, for census tracts that, um, that aren't bordering it. And I can use that weights object to calculate hotspots. So the metric that I'm using here is called the Getisord Local G, which functionally takes a look at the values for a given neighborhood, and then it compares that to the overall values for a study region and it then converts that to a z-score. So basically, if you're way above average for your region, you're going to get a high value. If you're way below value, way below average for your region, you're going to get a low value. And when I calculate that out, I'm going to make this object called g, excuse me, I calculate everything. And my object called G is going to be a numeric vector that has those G scores for each place. And so what I'm going to do here is now I'm going to use the mutate function, which comes from the tidyverse, to create some new columns. And so I'm going to make a new column in my orange diversity geo data set called local G based on the G scores. And then I'm going to make an another new column using some more advanced code here, some if else logic. It says if we're above some critical threshold, we're going to use the standard um, sort of z-score for um, uh, identifying um, significance under a normal distribution of 2.576, just as an arbitrary threshold here to identify what is a hotspot. So a hotspot greater than or equal to 2.576 or a cold spot less than or equal to 2.576. I go ahead and run that through, and then we can map out our hotspots. And so now I have a hotspot map. So up here, those red areas, those are our kind of statistically derived hotspots. Those are our high diversity areas. Our low diversity areas, interestingly enough, we've got Newport Beach, we've got Santa Ana. Those are the areas we kind of eyeballed before, but now we've formalized that with um, a hotspot analysis. The last bit, we've got 10 minutes left just about. I'll kind of step through these examples here. What if you want to get data for a custom area? Let's say I am investing in real estate, or I am wanting to build a new franchise for my business, or I'm trying to find, uh, you know, I'm doing social services and I'm trying to find uh, gaps. Um, and so I might have a specific location where I want to do an analysis. And the tricky thing is, 
I don't necessarily know. Um, I, I know that maybe I'm working in a county that's really big and I don't need all the data for that county. I just want data that is within a reasonable proximity of my location. And I, I wanna pull data for that and then tabulate that data and that's it. How do I do that? Well, this, is, this requires GIS style workflows. And you can make this reasonably sophisticated, but there's also functionality now built into Tidy Census that allows you to do this out of the box. Let me show you how this works. There's a new argument I wrote into the Tigers package a few months ago called filter by, which allows you to basically identify a custom shape and only get data back for that custom shape. And I didn't realize that this worked in Tidy Census until recently. It's one of those things you write software and then sometimes there are things in there that just work and they surprise you. And so I thought, oh, maybe I'll, I'll try this out because I thought I had written it that you could pass arguments through to Tigers from Tidy Census. So I tried it out and it worked. So you were among the first people to ever see this happening. So let me show you a couple of fun workflows. We're gonna do it a little bit on the fly uh, in a way that, uh, that we're deciding <coughs> as we build this out. So first things first, how do you get data for a custom shape? Like let's say I wanna go and draw a shape and I wanna get back only the demographic data that intersects that shape. And I don't necessarily know all the GIS tools yet. So can I do that in Tidy Census? Well, let me show you how this works. So there's a really fun package in R called MapEdit. MapEdit allows you to go on an interactive map and draw a shape, any shape that you want, and then create an object that represents that shape. So the draw features function allows us to do that. I'm gonna go ahead and run that. And so I get this interactive map. Now, Tidy Census works in the US, so I'm gonna to need to go to the US. Uh, let's head over here to Michigan and let's go to Ann Arbor. And let's uh, grab some data that kind of crosses county boundaries here. So let's say I wanna grab data that kind of goes into Ann Arbor, that goes across the county boundary here. And so I'm gonna start drawing a shape. I can click and define the vertices for that, sh for that shape. I just want this shape. And then you click the first point to close the shape. So now I've drawn a custom shape, just an arbitrary shape that I just made up. I'm gonna click done to make that shape. And if I wanted to, I could map view my shape. It's called shape. And it's gonna show me the shape that I just drew. So try that out for yourselves. One thing that is really fun now is you can go in here and you can now pull data by using this filter by argument for your shape, so long as you know where your shape is. So I could put in any variable I want. Um, let's say I wanna look at uh, some variable we've used in the workshop. I'm gonna type in one that I know off the top of my head, dp 200 68P. That's the percent of the population age 25 and up with a four-year college degree or higher. I'm going to do state equals MI for Michigan because I know that my shape was in Michigan. I need to do geometry equals true and then I do filter by equals shape. So I'm going to pull that down and then I can map you out my result. And now I've returned only census tracts that overlap or intersect that shape. So I now get custom data back. Now, granted, some of these shapes are gonna overlap my shape. Um, if I did something like map view shape data, and then I map view my shape, so plus map view shape, that layers on my shape. And you can see that some of these census tracts, they all overlap the shape, but they kind of cross over trying to figure out what the value is in that overlapping area, that is more advanced. Uh, there are workflows in Tidy Census to do that. Um, you can look at chapter seven of my book. I talk about that a little bit more in there. But at the very least, roughly, these are all the census tracts that are within the proximity of my shape. I could say kind of for this custom area that I've just defined, now I've pulled down data. I can map out that data and then maybe I can do some analysis around it. And as they can see, you know, predictably the area around Ann Arbor, 
you know, you've got some areas where almost everybody has a college degree. You go further east and you have some areas east of Ypsilanti where the educational attainment is lower. The last bit that I want to show you is um, how to create another kind of interesting example where you can use something like travel time areas to make calculations. Now, this is something where we're coming up against time, but I wrote a package called Mapbox API that <clears throat> allows you to go in and basically identify um, you know, for a given location, how you, uh, what it does just in a nutshell is it accesses all sorts of data, Mapbox data resources. So in this, Mapbox is a web mapping company. It's a navigation services company. And what Mapbox allows you to do if you go and get an account is you can make all sorts of interesting maps. You can use all sorts of interesting services and you're not gonna be able to replicate this right away. But keep this in mind, let me show you how this works. Mapbox API requires that we use, that we have an account with them. You don't need to put in a credit card to sign up or anything. Um, basically, they'll only ask for one if you exceed their free tier. And they have a pretty generous free tier. You'll go into a Mapbox account and by default, you'll get what's called an access token. And so I'm gonna copy over my access token uh, to use today. And I'm gonna put in any arbitrary address I want. So, you know, I could do something like, let's do Texas Christian University where I'm located right now. So I'm gonna do 2800 South University Drive, Fort Worth, Texas. I then can draw what's called an isochrone, which is a, a shape that represents the accessible area around that location under normal traffic conditions within a given time. So what is the area within 15 minutes of my location? Let me run this through. I can map view that out. And this is what my drive time area looks like. This is about 15 minutes. It's a shape that represents a 15 minute drive around my location. I then can use this in filter by. So I could go in and let's say I wanted to use this same variable for percent with a college degree. I'm gonna to need to do state equals Texas. I run my code. I now have only those areas that intersect that 15 minute drive time around TCU's campus. So uh, these are some kind of I would say cutting edge workflows for thinking about doing custom location analytics around a site for a drive time or for an arbitrary shape. And I was really excited to show you this and wow, 176 of you stuck around to the end to see it. So um, I really, really appreciate that. So uh, that's the show for today. Um, thanks again for, for coming out. I'll hand it back over to Bill.